here. Great. Um, okay. Um, so uh, as I noted, uh, we're going to be uh, today going through three sets of things. Um, the uh, first of uh, the items is we are going to create a uh, in or, a custom uh, Spark Cassandra interpreter uh, in Zeppelin. And the need for this um, was hinted at last time. Um, so during our last session, you may remember that we went through uh, a significant amount of um, uh, sort of modifications uh, uh, to uh, code in order to accommodate the need to provide information on the Cassandra server. So we needed to provide the um, Cassandra information uh, in the form of a machine, in the form of a username, in the form of a password. Do you remember that? We further had to deal with the fact that we needed to load in a special library to allow us to adapt uh, Spark to Cassandra. And we did this last time in a way that um, was a little bit, uh, frankly, clunky. Okay, um, so uh, specifically, we um, we had a uh, preceding header that uh, was uh, treated with an interpreter called DAP. Um, to be more um, precise about it, we should have actually called it uh, Spark DAP, Spark dot DAP, but. Um, uh, that interpreter basically allowed us to specify dependencies. And, uh, and then we um, needed to add the uh, various types of information to connect to Cassandra in line um, when we retrieved information from it. And for each and every time, we'd have to provide that sort of information. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to provide a better way, uh, courtesy of um, the inimitable Winchell, uh, Winchell Chen, um, uh, he's uh, provided us uh, with a better way to accomplish it. So you may remember we had something like, uh, okay, uh, like that, and um, uh, this uh, this was code up here that loaded in um, loaded in uh, the uh, the extra library. Uh, not quite sure why it's not showing properly, but it was uh, code in spark.dep. I just called it dep last time, which worked, but uh, spark.dep means uh, the dependencies for Spark. It reset it and it loaded in a certain library from Maven. That's that's why it's indicated with these colons. So it's, it's telling the Maven repository, give me such and such a library. Um, subsequently, we went and we um, uh, we obtained uh, tables from the Cassandra database. By every time we got a table, we have to specify the, uh, the machine name, uh, username, and password. And amongst other things, this betrayed my password, right? Uh, and it made it very awkward. Uh, and uh, we're going to look at a way that all this information that's highlighted, these guys, can be provided behind the scenes, okay? It's gonna be provided as part of an interpreter that we are going to create. Um, and uh, in order to do this, uh, there's gonna be a couple steps we'll go through. And these steps will broadly involve um, going, in, in going to the interpreter section of, of, of Zeppelin, saying we wanna create a new interpreter and filling in some settings there. That's step one. Those settings will basically correspond to these guys here, to, to, the, to this thing to load in, to um, the various properties to have here, and, uh, and to uh, some additional supporting information that will make it more convenient to deal with. So that's step one, we create the interpreter. Step two, we're going to actually place that interpreter um, at the, in the list of interpreters up here. So within Zeppelin, there's a list of the available interpreters. Um, 
Uh, I mentioned some of them last time. Spark is the one we've been using. And you notice it's marked as default. That reflects its topmost status here in Zeppelin, okay? So the one on the top is the default. You can always override that by specifying explicitly what interpreter to use for a given paragraph. But uh, absent uh, overriding, it's going to use the default here, okay? Um, You'll notice there's many other interpreters here. This is just for a simple markdown. It's for a uh, markdown that, that specifies um, a text that you can use to provide some information. Um, uh, there's uh, other interpreters that we're gonna be using in the course of coming weeks, um, which are going to be really useful for displaying, for example, output, displaying graphs, using the type of data we're gathering from, from uh, Spark, okay? Okay, um, so we're going to be adding our interpreter to the top of this list, so it's the default one. So that's the second step. Uh, the third step is going to be that we need to provide a way for uh, that interpreter to, to not be thrown away after we end Docker every time. So by default, all these settings, all these settings for interpreters um, and, and uh, are going to be thrown away. So if we if we go over, you notice on the upper right, there's this thing that says anonymous. Do you see that? Um, if you go and uh, pull that down, you'll see interpreter. And if you go down to the interpreter here, what you will see is a bunch of settings for each interpreter, okay? We're going to be adding one of these, okay? Uh, we're gonna be using this create button. But normally that will be thrown away. This is all packaged up in Docker. Docker keeps this information inside of it. And the Docker image is, is basically starting from scratch each time we use it. So all this interpreter modifications we put in place, all the changes to settings here are by default thrown away. So the third step is we're gonna need to copy that information to persist it in a file just copy it out of Docker and put it in a file so that every time we invoke Docker, it uses that information, okay? So it's not thrown away each time. Does that make sense? Is the audio coming through? Okay, good. Okay, so the, these are the tasks uh, that lie before us, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put up uh, on the screen here, and actually I think that I will um, to make this easiest, um, I'm actually going to just uh, send a, a, a mail to myself here um, with this information. I can refer to it and walk you through it using a mobile device here. But uh, so this is a Spark Cassandra interpreter, okay? And I'm just going to send this to myself. Um, but basically, we're going to go through a set of steps here, okay? And uh, to go through those steps, I'd like you to go to this anonymous menu, pick interpreters, okay? This is defining the settings for the interpreter, okay? Um, uh, you notice that this is parallel to, to all these different particular notes we have in place, okay? Secondly, we're going to use create, the create button, okay? Now, the create button um, is going to allow us to define a new interpreter. And this new interpreter, we need to specify uh, uh, configuration information for it so that it's set up uh, properly, okay? So first of all, we're going to set the interpreter name to be spark-cassandra. Now, with your leave, I'm gonna say Cassandra 2 here just because secretly I've already defined one, okay? And I don't wanna show it to you because it has my real password, okay? Um, Actually, I, I have no problem showing it to you, but I don't want to show it to the world, okay? Um, some of whom are listening, including the most important person there uh, in the world, which is Winchell. Um, okay, uh, uh, so um, interpreter name is this. The interpreter group will be Spark. So this is going to be an interpreter that's a variant of the Spark interpreter with some tweaks, okay? Interpreter group. Next. And, and again, I have to give total credit to Winchell, who has worked long and worked late 
to create these definitions, okay? And I'm simply benefiting from his largesse and generosity. This interpreter will be installed per note and isolated per note process. What this means is if we have several different notebooks, each of which is using Spark or using this Spark Cassandra interpreter, each of them is isolated from each other. So we don't have to worry about the fact that one is stomping on something the other is trying to use, or one is reset and it resets the others as well, okay? It's, by and large, it's not gonna be a concern, but in principle, it could cause more resources because different interpreters might have different Spark interpreters going. But normally, we're gonna be sort of closing out Spark after each session, and there might be one or two, and that's an offset. Okay, so let me re I, I gave it a name. I gave it an interpreter group. I said it's instantiated per node in an isolated process, okay? Now, um, we, we have to do some, uh, some more detailed work now. So the first thing I'd like you to do is, if, if you go down, um, there's a property called zeppelin.spark.useHive context. I'd like you to set that, ladies and gentlemen, to false, okay? Just change it from true to false. This is uh, going to, um, um, this is good, not essential, but it's gonna provide us some, um, some extra protections um, in terms of the, the um, uh, in terms of the use of SQL context rather than, than uh, Hive context. Okay, uh, we want SQL context. Okay, next, what I'd like you to do now is really the core, at the core couple things. First, we're gonna specify those properties that we had to specify in line before, namely the, the Spark machine we're gonna connect to, oh, sorry, the Cassandra machine, the Cassandra username and the Cassandra password, okay? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Um, so uh, for, uh, for the name, I'm going to set, uh, uh, if, uh, we're going to set spark dot Cassandra dot connection dot host. Okay. I forgot to tell you, I recognize this is going to be tedious, but once we do it, it's done and we'll be able to reuse it all future sessions and we won't have to type it again. Okay. Okay. Spark dot Cassandra dot connection dot host. Make sure the Cassandra is spelled with two S's. Okay. And here we're going to specify blin cheeky, b l i n c h i k i dot u s s dot c f. Okay. Again, for the, anyone attending remotely outside the U S, I'm afraid this is a U of S machine. Okay. So um, where did that? Whence did? Whither did that go? It went up here. Spark dot Cassandra dot connection dot host blin cheeky dot u s s dot c f. Do you see that? Okay, next. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna specify the username. So here we can actually copy and paste a large part of that, but uh, it's spark.cassandra.auth.username. And we might as well copy through the auth dot because we're gonna use it for the password in a moment, okay? Username, it's going to be your username, whatever it is, mine is Nate. Okay, are we okay with that? Okay, spark.cassandra.auth.username. And again, we do plus, and it gets added to the list of properties up here. So here we are, okay? So these are gonna be properties that Spark Cassandra knows about when it's running. It, it, it knows those, and so it's not gonna need them from us when we connect to the server, okay? The final thing is could be the same, spark.cassandra.auth.password. And I'm gonna put in fake, you know, or your password, whatever it is, right? For Cassandra. These are Cassandra passwords. Uh, Cassandra usernames, Cassandra passwords, okay? Spark.cassandra.auth.password. And we add that as well, okay? Okay, we're almost done with the tedium, okay? Okay, now, 
what we're going to do is we're going to do one final thing. Does anyone remember what it is? What was that other code that we did uh, that we had in place last time? Um, it had it specified these, but there was something else we had to do. Do you remember it involved percent depth? What did we do besides that? Reset those boom. Yeah, we we reset in, in actually we reset uh, the Spark and and we loaded in a certain library. So I'm going to tell you a library to load in. Okay, and. Don't be confused by the fact that this is slightly different than last time. That's really not material. It's just Wintrill pointed out there's a more recent version of the library we loaded in last time. Uh, we might as well just use that. And so I, um, I'm, I'm just using uh, that one per Wintrill's uh, guidance, okay? Um, which I think makes a lot of sense because uh, the other one was kind of an interim release, okay? Um, I'll spell this out more completely, but basically it's com.datastacks with an X dot spark colon and then spark dash Cassandra dash connector under bar 2.11 colon 2.0.7. I realize that's a mouthful. Okay, I, I'll go put this on a bigger screen, okay, so that you can see it in in its um, in it with with clarity. Let's just go see. Can I uh, enlarge fart? Okay, here we go. P -p 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 -p. What do you think? Good or not? No. Yeah. Okay, so. This is specifying to Maven again. That's why we have these various colons. Maven is this repository of libraries. And it's an amazing repository of libraries with all different versions of different libraries from different originators. Here's he, that this this illustrates this is you know your version numbers and I think 2.11 is indicated the version of uh, Scala with which it's compatible. Um, and uh, this may be the originator over over here, um, uh, associated with sort of the the path, uh, the um, the package there. In any case, um, we're specifying to the Maven repository what library we want to get. Does that make sense? And notice we're putting this here. Oh, I'm putting it in the wrong place. I'm sorry. I I screwed up. It's going into this here. Dependencies. I'm I'm terribly sorry. Group ID, artifact ID version. It's going into here, sorry. Artifact, okay. Now, the thing that's a little bit confusing about this section is you actually, remember before we use plus to add it in? You actually don't wanna use plus here, okay? You just wanna say save, okay? And it will, it will save it, okay? So, um, this is, if we go down to the bottom of our interpreters, we're still in this interpreter area, right? If we go down to the bottom, we will see this one we just created, Spark Cassandra 2, after we press that add. Did you see that? Or save, rather. Do you see that? Okay. So again, it's a certain name. It's instantiated per node in an isolated process. And we have the various settings automatically set here. Uh, and we tell it, hey, when you start up, load this thing in. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so that's step one. That's by far the most tedious thing. Okay? Okay, now, the next two steps could be undertaken in either order. I'd like to kind of, just to minimize risk and and to kind of cluster the tedium in, in in one place, what I'd like you to do is actually undertake the next action uh, immediately, okay? Um, and uh, here we're going to uh, we're going to copy, we're going to persist these settings because these settings, would normally be lost when we leave Docker. 
we leave Docker and everything's reset. It's, it's just its original image. It's not going to remember this at all. So we have to somehow export these settings. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay. So in order to do that, and once again, this all this all is is thanks to Winshow. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the same folder from which I invoked Docker. I started Docker from when I was in some folder, my present working directory or somewhere. I just want to be in that folder. Okay. Next, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to say Docker CP. That's a command. There's all these different Docker commands, which um, I think I'm going to do a, a sort of greatest hits of Docker commands for this class, just what we need for this class. After, after this video, I'm going to go on and do a video just so you know how to get around Docker a little bit. Um, but just for, for the moment, Docker CP basically is allowing us to say, hey, Docker, um, from, from, from within a Docker container, do a copy. And we're going to copy something from within the Docker container to, uh, to this folder, to outside the Docker container. Okay, So we're going to do a copy. And uh, this copy is inside of Docker. It's a, it's, it's a Docker copy. Um, and we're going to say it's Zeppelin. We have Zeppelin running and Docker right now. Okay, so we're going to say, "Hey, for the Docker, for the Zeppelin Docker container, um, I'd like to copy from Zeppelin." So there's a colon here slash Zeppelin slash conf slash interpreter dot JSON. So this is saying within the Zeppelin container. Go to this path and copy that JSON file within this Docker, the Zeppelin Docker container that's currently running. Copy that to the present working directory dot here. Okay. Okay. So what it did is Docker's running. Um, Docker's running over here. This is my Docker right, uh, that I started earlier. Here we go. And and it went into Docker and said, hey, you know, give me that file. And it gave it the file and it copied it here. So if I go and I look at this place, I will see interpreter.json and it just got updated. Okay. And if you go look in that, rep, um, you know, Cassandra 2, I'm just going to look, you know, or, or you could do Spark dash Cassandra, right? Um, but I'm going to look at Cassandra 2. That was the name of mine, right? That was the name of, of my interpreter here, right? That was the name of my interpreter was Spark Cassandra 2. So I'm just taking a sub piece of this. I could say the whole name if I wanted to. And I'm going to look in interpreter.json, and there it is. See it? So it contains that information. And if we went in there, we'd see the password and username and all that sort of stuff. Okay? Okay. Um, now, Winchell had noted that probably for hygiene of your file systems, you know, you might want to create a subfolder where all your notebooks live, this interpreter JSON file lives, your um, any other sort of settings related logs live, et cetera, in a subfolder. Group them all together. Um, uh, I, for simplicity here, I decided not to emphasize that, but it's a good suggestion. Okay. So for example, off this same folder, this present working directory, um, we have my notebooks. Okay, these are my various Zeppelin notebooks here. They were created where I started it. Um, and that's a point I'll come back to because how Zeppelin behaves is actually a little bit different um, uh, when you evoke it from different directories because it's looking for a notebook underneath it, for notebooks underneath its current folder. Okay. Okay, so here's interpreter.json, and it's filled with information on the interpreters. So that's the second step, okay? We exported our definitions so that in the future, we can just use those. We don't have to retype that, we just reuse it. And we'll see that, that there's a, 
there's a Docker command line. When you start Docker, when you start Docker um, each time, there's a little command line you're issuing, and and all you're going to do is provide a, a reference to um, uh, to this interpreter.json file we just created. Okay, and it's going to be basically placed um, to be used as it's going to be used as this uh, interpreter.json and and um, in the Docker image. Okay, so we've exported it to persist it. So it doesn't disappear with the Docker image, and then we're going to be using it every time. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, the third thing is going to be using it. Maybe what we'll do is just to get a sort of certain unity to it, and so you don't have to worry that you'll go away and it won't run next time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to leave Docker or leave Cassandra I, or leave Zeppelin. So here's Zeppelin, right? I'm going to leave this, but does that get rid of the Docker image or the Docker container from running? No, no. Yeah. the Docker container, I mean, the Docker container is running regardless whether there's a browser that happens to point to it. In fact, it may not even be aware of this browser currently looking at it because the browser just happens to passively depict it. So in order to, in order to stop this Docker container, I need to do a uh, I need to issue a command to Docker, and that command is well. You can see it up there. Docker stop Zeppelin. Okay. Now you may wonder how do I know to say Zeppelin? Well, another thing you could do is you could do Docker ps, and it's going to tell you oh, in Docker these processes are running, and um, this is this is the name Zeppelin. You can also refer to it by this. Um, but uh, Winter points out this is often just much more convenient. Okay, so I could say Docker stop Zeppelin. There's actually a Docker kill as well. Okay, and Docker kill is more um, transgressive in its efforts. It's more um, it, it's more aggressive. And generally, you want to try Docker stop unless you know what you really know what you're doing, you want to try Dr. Stop first because that's a little bit more gentle. It may allow it to save some information away before dying. Dr. Kill, as as Yuan taught me many years ago, said Yaola. Um, <laughs> so uh, it it just it's dead and gone, okay? Um, immediately. And and so Dr. Stop is advised. So if I do Dr. Stop, then I do Docker PS. It's uh, it's th there's nothing running. Okay, and you'll notice if I if I go and I look where I started it from, now it's gone. Okay, so this next step, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to put in place just a little bit more mechanism. When you start Docker up, you're going to want to start it from this folder where you put the interpreter.json and you're going to want to add in, make sure you have this, I think, you, make sure you have this dash dash rm minus v, this thing, uh, uh, this thing here. I, actually, I think the, the minus rm, I actually am not sure that goes with it. That's separate. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe Luce should be teaching this as well. But uh, this is, this minus v, I think, is basically grouped with this. So. So here, make sure you do a minus V, um, and basically it's your present working directory, your interpreter. Um, you don't actually have to have this dollar sum PWD um, if if it's just in your current current folder. You know, you could just say interpreter dot JSON. I don't think it requires that. It's a good question. In any case, um, I think you could probably spare that uh, without doing it, but I'm not sure. And then colon, and then you want this slash zeppelin slash conf slash interpreter dot json okay i'll give you a minute to get that in but meanwhile i'll copy it into the big screen here okay here we go um this is what you're doing okay and again i i can't swear whether or not it will work without that i i suspect it would but i don't know okay so this is going to allow us to use the contents of this interpreter.json as our interpreter specification for this invocation of Docker. 
And we're going to want to use this on a regular basis, okay? Does anyone want me to send this to you via Moodle? Would that be handy? Like, would, would that be good? Okay, sure. Um, so what I will do here is, and I apologize to those online, but I'll here I'll go to Moodle. Um, and I will go log in. And I will sign in here. And I will um, uh, go to to this and send it to participants. And I'll send it to all participants. Uh, um, hey, select all, boom. And send a message. And I will, I will actually copy it from here. Because there's actually one other innovation that I'm giving you for free. And this innovation cost Winchell many hours of lost sleep last night. Um, oh. Uh, uh, that doesn't make sense because I'm on Moodle right now. Unless it was a like a temporary thing. Um, let's, let's try that again. Okay, yeah. Transient thing. Okay, so this is the the new Docker command line. Okay, um, here we go, and I'm going to send the message here. Okay, um, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is sent to you. If you want to use it, you're welcome to do so. Let me highlight one other innovation with this. Uh, uh, with this, the other innovation is see this dash dash net equals host. We're going with that for now. Basically, what, what I discovered last night and what, what Winchell confirmed and, and figured out the solution for is that certain on certain machines, it seems that the U of S VPN does not play nicely with Docker. And so without this, within Docker, it it's not able to look up if you're going through a VPN, it's not able to look up certain machine names, okay? But if you have this dash dash net equals host, then it can work okay through a VPN, um, through the VPN. Now, this seems to be platform specific. It seems to be a Linux thing, the, the version of the same product, Cisco AnyConnect, the VPN product for Mac seems to work okay with with Docker, and so it's it's a little bit confusing. but but. It doesn't hurt, I think, to put this in. Okay, are we okay with that? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start it. So we had done Docker stop, we had stopped our Docker, and now we've started again, and you could see that it, it started up this process, right? Okay, so having started Docker, we can now go and engage in probing behavior on Docker. So we can go, we can go interact with it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is go connect to my Docker uh, for Zeppelin. Oops. There we go. Boom. And there we go. This. And I am going to go to a, a notebook, which um, uh, we created, uh, I created before, which is going to use this. And this is going to use the, the new settings. But you don't have this notebook yet. You're going to be following along. And I'm going to ask you to enter some information. So before you do you do anything, I'd like you to do, you'd like you to, first of all, double check something. Double check that the interpreters are loaded from that file. Right? How would you do that? How would you double check they've been loaded? How would you check that this is working with the full set of interpreter, the set interpreter settings we just set? How would you do that? Uh, okay, you could check that it's working. That would actually be um, one way to do it. Another way is you can go to anonymous interpreter, and this remember provides the full set. And if you scroll down here, what you will see at the bottom should be the one you created. Do you see that? Okay. That's the one you created. So that indicates it is successfully loading. It is successfully loading from 
this interpreter.json file that you had persisted, you had saved away. If, if it weren't, every time you restart Docker, it'd be with the same set of interpreter settings exactly. So here it's actually, this guy is working. This part of the command is working. If it's not that, talk with Luce. Um, <laughs> or, 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 or try to study it, okay? Um, are, are people okay with this? Okay. okay. Hearing no objections, I'm gonna continue. Does anyone need help? Anyone need a bit more time? No shame yeah. to that. Bit more time? Yeah. Is it is it causing issues? Okay, so what did we do? We restarted Docker with a new command line. This new command line told it to use this interpreter.json file that we had previously rescued out of Docker, right? We salvaged it out of Docker after changing the settings. Anytime you change the settings, you're gonna wanna re-extract that, right? Anytime you change the settings in the interpreter's area of Docker, this area, this interpreter area, anytime you change the settings, you're going to want to do this whole thing again, okay? Docker, CP, Zeppelin. Does anyone need more time? Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, okay. So, um, uh, do, 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 uh, repo name must be lower case. Um, Did you miss the dash V? Um, no. I'm wondering if it's because, uh, hmm, that should, okay. Uh, a repository name. Hmm. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't invalid reference format. Okay, what I suggest, do, do you have the old command you used to use? Like, when you started Docker earlier, were you starting it with from the command line like this? That'd be worth looking at. Um, to to figure that out. Um, maybe someone could uh, try to help Lujia. Would you mind looking look at hers? You might want to also just echo dollar sign pwd to make sure it's defined in, in the shell there. The repo name must be lowercase. Maybe it, someone could also um, search online for it. Repository name must be lowercase. Why that would come up with Docker? Huh. Uh, that sounds like something that would that would come up when it's specifying the repo to use. Um, mm, like this this thing down here. Huh. Yeah, that's really odd. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, what I'm gonna uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'd, I'd like uh, if someone else could could watch here for uh, corrections with that, try to figure out what's blocking in that case. I'd like to show how we can use this. Okay, so we've just restarted Docker. We've confirmed that Zeppelin includes this this uh, interpreter, and now I'd like to use it, okay? So to use it, we're going to go to a, to a, a notebook. You might wanna go to that notebook we created last time. Spaces and project directory names are incompatible with Docker. Do you have spaces in the path name? Ah, good call. So maybe, uh, it's, yeah, so it's, uh, Nella very helpfully created a subfolder where she could group things. Yeah. But that subfolder happens to have a space in its name. And I think that's what's throwing it off, probably. 
So maybe you could rename the name of the folder to have an underbar instead of a space. And, and then we could try it, okay? Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we previously, do you remember last time we had created this, Cassandra, we had created some code? If you go there, you should be able to do um, here, clone this note. So that notebook, which we created last time, you should be able to find it. And there should be a thing called clone this note. Do you see that? And if you do clone this note, it'll create a new notebook with all these same things. So you don't have to modify what you did last time. You can leave it in place because it works. But now we'll do it more elegantly. So this is what I did. I cloned it, okay? I did clone this node, it created a new notebook. And then I went and I went to that new notebook. And then I removed some stuff. So in the new notebook, I don't need this anymore. Why not? Why don't I need this anymore? Yeah, I have to put an associate with the interpreter. So for some reason it's not visible here, but I can use the equivalent of this. And I can, I can go down to this remove and remove that right for this for this very first thing. So, so in short, I cleaned it up and I removed the information about the um, about the, did that work? Okay, awesome. Thank you, Wade. Um, okay, so I removed this information as well. Why don't we need to provide that because it's associated with the Interpret. Oh, oh! I forgot one other thing to emphasize. I'm sorry. This is true. All the, all what I've said is true. But I again need to emphasize something which, which I have mentioned before. We need here to do interpreter bindings, and we want to drag Spark Cassandra up to the top, ladies and gentlemen. So in this new notebook, the one that was created, we need to do interpreter binding and drag Spark Cassandra to be the topmost. Why? Why the topmost? Because by being the topmost, it's the default. See that? Do you see that? Okay, so you go to this guy here. Is it not listed? Oh. Oh, okay. It's probably because those are, you probably created this folder for this purpose. The, like this, the special. So what you're going to want to do it. So it finds your old notebooks. You could just close this for now, and you can stop Docker. What you want to do is you want to copy the notebook folders that were whatever folder you invoked it from last time. In in past sessions, you started Docker from somewhere. Yeah. That has a subfolder called notebook, and you want to put that into the new folder. So in other words. Wherever you start Docker from, for, for Zeppelin, it's going to create some subfolders, OK? Uh, wherever you started from, it's going to create a notebook folder. See this now? It's creating a notebook folder. Um, it's creating a log logs folder. And if you create a new folder to group things together from now on, that's great. But you want to get your old things. And the old things are in that folder you used to start it in. And you want to just copy those to the new folder, like just move them to the new folder. Just move them. I say copy, but I mean move. Um, just just move the notebook folder there. So I've been invoking this from my home folder, which is reprehensible. But um, there's my note logs. There's my notebook. <laughs> and if I were to create a new folder called Zeppelin, Zeppelin Spark or something. Um, uh, if I want to invoke Docker from there and have access to my old notebooks, I have to copy. I have to move these to that new folder. Does that make sense? I still have the logs and notebooks. Um, okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, could well, could someone take a look at that in the old folder? Um, so. Uh, so these these notebook and logs should be wherever you invoke Docker from. And if you invoke Docker from some other place in the file system, it's going to create notebook and logs there. Okay. 
So you found them, or? Yeah, I could um, reuse the command that won't solve the notebooks. Sorry. Uh, won't save the logs and notebooks outside the right. command to be used. Yeah. So there's a way to expose them. Oh, because they were stored outside of Docker? Yeah, they, they are stored. Uh, no. Inside of Docker? Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, well, that's painful. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, so yeah, the key thing here is this allows you. And I'm sorry, I should have emphasized this before. This allows you to save in a notebook folder, save the notebooks from Zeppelin. This allows you to have save in a logs folder, the logs from Zeppelin. And so when you start Zeppelin, it creates logs in notebook here. You see that? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we when we start this up, we need to drag, if it's not the first one, we need to drag it up there to be the default. Do you see that? Drag it to the top. So unless we specify a different interpreter, we're gonna use that. And then you gotta do save, okay? And now, now you're gonna be able to import uh, this, okay? So for those who are, who are uh, able to follow this? If you do, this should be the uh, one of the lines that you invoked before, right? The code that you invoked before should include this, and you should be able to run it. Unfortunately, it's somehow off the top of my screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's off the top here, but it, there should be a little, a little uh, uh, run this paragraph. And you should be able to run this, and it should be able to load this file. What are this class, these classes in? Where do these come from? Where do these get loaded from? How does it know where to go to load these? Or how does it load these? These come with what? Maven. Yeah, they go to Maven, and it knows how to get them from Maven using this these interpreter settings down here, right? Right, right here. It knows how to go get them from Maven with this this guy here, this dependency. Do you see that? Do you see that? Okay. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, just uh, continuing on here. Um, so we should be able to load this in, and if that works. That's a sure sign that this interpreter is working fine, okay? That the fact that you can do this import com.datastacks.spark.connector under bar, or dot under bar, yeah. Yeah. If you have lost notebooks, I can send you notebooks, okay? Um, okay, next, I'd like you to try this. This is, just a variant of what we did last time. So if you have your old notebook, you should be able to literally delete three lines from it. Delete the lines which specify the machine, the username, and the password. You should be able to delete them, and all you have to do is include these things, okay? So I'm going to invoke these here, um, and unfortunately, because I'm having trouble reaching the the run thing there i'm just going to copy that down and it's it should load this in through the network okay and and then i should be able to do this this is again the same code we ran last time it's just missing those three lines that did the configuration last time we had this exact same code with these lines and all i did was delete these these three lines why do we? Why can we delete those three lines? This is the code we had last time. I deleted these. Why? Do, why can we de delete them? 
because they're specified in the config associated with the custom interpreter, right? So here's the interpreters, and way down here in the bottom, we had spark.cassandra.username, password, and connection host, which is precisely the things that we were specifying previously here. So by virtue of putting those associated with the interpreter, we can get rid of them here. Do you see this? And we should be able to do this. Boom. Okay. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, this should allow you to get it and we should be able to now print the schema. This is kind of the proof in the pudding. You can do print schema and it will print out for you the schema of things, okay? Are we okay with that? Okay. Hearing no objections. Okay, and now I'm gonna print out the number of, of, of rows in there, okay? I'll do DSGPS. Okay, boom. And I think this is one that will take a little bit of time. It's going to load it in, load in a whole swack of records. I think there's millions and millions of records and it's gonna be counting them up. Okay, here it is. And uh, it's going to report for me account, okay? Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, we have now updated this code from last time to be more secure, more convenient. We don't have to, every time we go get a table, specify the username and password and so on. Um, instead, we should be able to much more conveniently just focus on the details of what key space we want and so on. And uh, more than that, we should be able to avoid having to have that magic Dep code spark .dep, loading the loading in the external dependency. Are we okay? Okay. Um, so, um, is more help needed over there? Good. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've just seen this. I'm going to just go over with an eye towards helping some of us catch up, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pause this or, or complete this video, which provides a new custom interpreter. I'm then gonna show a few Docker commands, okay? Which are nice to know things beyond this, okay? Um, and, and that will give you a sense of how to work with Docker additionally at a practical level for these, um, for these projects, okay? Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, go and uh, cease the video recording, okay? Um, and uh, I could do stop sharing here, boom. And where is my video recording going on? Okay, uh, here it is. Here it is, and I will stop this temporarily, or stop this and go on.